first I wanted to introduce myself. I do know a lot of you. I don't know everybody here. Um, my name is Trish McPherson. I uh, was born and raised in a little town, St. Albans, West Virginia, and I was hoping our extension agent would be here because after I met Gina, she was talking about she was grew up in a little town in St. Albans, and I went, I said, well, where is that? She said, well, St. Albans. So we grew up in the same town, went to the same high school. Of course, I was there many, many years before she was there. Uh, it was just a, a small world. And then after I finished high school, I wanted to be a marine biologist. So I went and applied and got into the University of Michigan. And I went to Michigan and quickly found out that oceanography is all engineering and math and physics, and I wanted to be a marine biologist. So I switched to zoology, got my uh, bachelor's at University of Michigan, and I had a professor there in my last year who was studying aggressive behavior in hermit crabs. So when I got into school at UNC Chapel Hill for an actual master's in marine biology, my did my thesis work on aggressive behavior in hermit crabs. And professors here were like, you're doing what for your master's? They let me do it, and I had a good time, and I got my degree, so that was a good thing. But then after you get a degree in marine biology, there are no jobs in marine biology. So the uh, power company at that time, Progress Energy, was hiring, and they were working on a project of cooling towers at the nuclear plant down south. Fork. So I did actually do marine biology work, or actually estuarine biology, for about a year, and then taught myself freshwater biology, and I worked for the power company for about eight years and doing all um, freshwater. My specialty was in macroinvertebrates, which are the bugs that live on the bottoms of rivers and streams. And then after I got married, moved back up to Raleigh, and then I worked with the Division of Water Quality for 25 years. And I ended up being their um, supervisor of biological assessment unit. So I've been doing stream bugs for 30 plus years and then I actually became a master gardener the same year I retired, which was about seven years ago, and have been doing gardening since then. That's become my new passion. I um, help take care of two water-wise gardens, one at the state fairgrounds, one at Lake Crabtree County Park, and then help volunteer here at the, uh, the Arboretum. And because I am in charge of two water-wise gardens, that kind of brings me to the topic today. Gina asked if I could give a talk about either pollinator gardens or water-wise gardens. And I thought maybe the topic should be pollinator gardens should all be water-wise gardens. And so what I want to do today is talk about what's a pollinator garden, what's a water-wise garden, is there really a difference between the two, talk about what a good pollinator garden should have, talk a little bit about the pollinators, and then go through some of the good pollination plants, kind of season by season. And I'm going to be using our water-wise garden as an example because I personally think it's a good pollinator garden. And then go through some of the principles of water-wise gardening. And um, at the end, I think they're trying to get this gardening series to be uh, a talk that would then generate discussion. So they set it up as two hours, and I'm certainly not going to talk nearly that long. Uh, so, so then after I finish, maybe we could get a discussion going about pollinator gardens or if you have questions about water-wise gardens. So first off, what is a pollinator garden? I put in here a picture of the trial bed because an awful lot of people think immediately of flowers when they think about pollinator gardens. The pollinator gardens and could also include trees and shrubs and vines and ground covers. And um, I brought in here two, the last two May issues of Carolina Gardener, and it's called Open invitation, how to attract pollinators to your garden and populate with pollinators. And right now, since I've had time to retire and go to garden lectures and 
get garden magazines and read them, I found that certain garden plants and garden types are in, and then they go out of style. And right now, pollinator gardens are in, and they're sexy. Uh, water wise gardens, on the other hand, were in a few years back, but they're not in right now, and, and they should be because it's so easy to do water wise gardening. So I'm going to talk about pollinator garden basically is um, having forage plants or plants that produce pollen, having nest sites for the pollinators, having water and to reduce pesticide use, and then you would have a good pollinator garden. Um, so what is a water-wise garden? This is a picture of the state fairgrounds water-wise garden. To me, it looks like it would be an ideal pollinator garden. The water-wise garden that we have over there, we water plants when we first put them in. We, and once they're established, which takes usually about a month or so, we don't do any more supplemental watering. And we actually do our planting at the water-wise garden in the spring because that's when a lot of the perennial plants are available. And we teach everybody when, as master gardeners that you should not plant in the spring, you should fall, plant in the fall, but it's perfectly okay to plant in the spring as long as you water when you first uh, plant things. Uh, and also in the fall, we're having the state fair and unless you wanna pay to get in and deal with 100,000 people a day, it's better to get your garden going and started, and so that's what we do. But the key to water-wise garden, and I'll probably repeat this until you're tired of hearing it, is right plant in the right place, and I'll go into more detail later. Um, right plant, right place, good soil to begin with, and mulch. Mulch is really a key component of water-wise gardening. Yes, Debbie. So yeah, Debbie is the queen bee of pollinator gardens. Uh, if you get nothing else out of this talk on pollinator gardens, you should write down the website protectpollinators.org. Debbie Ruse is the co cooperative extension agent for Chatham County. She has started what she calls her pollinator paradise garden over at Chatham Mills in Pittsburgh. It's uh, a garden that is almost all native plants. She really uh, wants to do a lot of native plants. She, it's built around the parking lot. It's not a huge garden, but she's probably got 165 different kinds of plants in there. She gives regular tours, I think, she just recently put on her website a list of additional tours. She had a pollinator festival um, last week. And the way that you know when pollinator gardens are in and sexy, there's probably have been four pollinator festivals in the last month, like Crabtree's having one in June. If you look in the paper, every nursery and garden center is having some kind of pollinator workshop. But that's a good thing because the pollinators now are losing habitat. They're trying, we're, we are trying to get people to reduce the use of chemicals and pesticides in their garden because those are damaging the pollinators. But this is a really fun place to go. The Chatham Mills has a uh, restaurant, it's a co-op. There is a restaurant right next to it and there's even a winery right around the corner so you could make, you know, a good half day trip over to Pittsburgh, but you were well worth your time. But she knows probably more about uh, pollinators than probably anybody else, and I've heard her give a couple of talks. And her website is a lot of resources, a lot of information about bees, some absolutely gorgeous photographs about bees and the flowers. And if you have questions about what might be blooming at what time of the year. She posts pictures season by season, and she has also a list of her top 25 pollinator plants, which I've got the list here. And after the talk, if people have questions about what they are, we could go over that. 
So I want to talk about the importance of pollinators. Why do we care about them? Well, 80% of the flowering plants depend on pollinators. So that means um, or in order for the uh, pollination to occur to a good extent, I mean, you can get pollination by wind and a lot of plants are, are self-pollinating, but I found a, a website, it was the University of Georgia, that was saying that if you really want fertile seeds and full-bodied fruit, the more pollen grains that from well, pollination basically is pollen from the male part, which is the anther, has to hit the female part of the flower, which is the stigma, and then it's fertilized. Well, if a few pollen grains land, then you'll get fertilization, but the more pollen grains that land on the female part of the flower, the, the seed, the, the better quality fruit. So if you really want good tomatoes and squash and vegetables and flowers or um, flowers in your uh, redbud tree and full-bodied fruit, then the additional help that you get from pollinators is a good thing. And I, yeah. just want to add that first cucumber there probably was not uh, fully pollinated. Right. See how that had a little nub so right on the here, end? This means it didn't get enough pollen grains on that cucumber flower. And I just had to bring a, a picture of from our garden. We have a lot of blueberries and we have a small garden, but we always plant the same things every year. And I think a lot of t attention has been brought to the importance of pollinators by the colony collapse disorder in honeybees. Um, not sure that everybody knows, but honeybees are not native to North America. They have been imported from Europe and Africa. They have become naturalized here. But honeybees is a $15 billion industry in this country. Not only from the honey and the honey products, but a lot of the mega farms that are especially out west, they bring in truckloads and truckloads of hives of honeybees in order to pollinate because on average a honeybee will only go about two miles to, to look for pollen. So in order to get the fertilization they need in these large farms, they will bring in truckloads of um, honeybees. And with the colony collapse problems, which I think now that's mainly varroa mites and, and pesticides are a problem. It could be partly bacterial problems. There's a lot of things contributing to that, but it has one good thing, and it has brought attention to the importance of pollinators. And if you think about all the food, all the fibers, cotton, linen, any kind of medicine that comes from a plant has to have the pollinator to um, produce the, the fruit or the flowers that are used in the medicines. And even your morning coffee and your morning tea depend on pollinators. So bees are the most important pollinators. Um, Debbie Roos, when she gave a talk, uh, she mentioned that there are 4,000 native bees in North America. And yet, most people think about the honeybee. There are 400 to 500 native species just in North Carolina. And I was thinking, you know, I can name sweat bees, <laughs> mason bees, Bumblebee. I then then I start like, what other kind of bees are there? And then I found out that the blueberry bee. I didn't even know that there was a blueberry bee. Is probably the third or fourth most important pollinator after honeybees are most important. Bumblebees are probably the second most important, but blueberry bees, and it looks just like a regular bee, except for it's got white on its face. So if you ever see in early spring on your blueberries, if you have them, a bee. But it's interesting because it has an unusual way to pollinate, and it's called buzz pollination. It will vibrate its wings at a really high speed when it's 
up inside the blueberry flower, and that causes the pollen to basically just shake off the male part, and it will get on the female, it will also get on the bee, the bee will then transfer it to the, <coughs> the next flower, it doesn't, and that's how most native bees, they are much more hairy than a honeybee, and that's how they transfer the pollen. The honeybee actually goes and forages for pollen, whereas most of the native bees, uh, well, they are foraging for pollen also. But other insects such as flies, beetles, ants, and moths are also very important. Hummingbirds, bats, even small mammals. I found out that um, the flies, there is a nurseryman in Pittsburgh who raises pawpaws, and it's a native shrub and a fruit that you usually don't find in grocery stores because it's just hard to ship it. But it is pollinated by flies, and only by flies. So the guy in Pittsburgh hangs dead fish throughout his orchard <laughs> to attract flies to pollinate his pawpaw trees. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> that to me, and he has a pawpaw festival sometime in August. So if you can Google pawpaw festival, I think I'm gonna go and just to see what it, I mean, by then the fruit is on the tree and he wouldn't have the dead fish hanging there, but that would be kind of neat. And then I found out just this weekend that beetles are the pollinators of magnolias. Apparently magnolias were one of the first plants to um, be around millions of years ago. And um, bees had not evolved yet but beetles had been evolved. So the beetles and the magnolias were around at the same time millions and millions of years ago, and they have stayed together through the millions of years. I mean, there are other bees and, and wasps and things are gonna be found on magnolias, but beetles are still the primary pollinator. So, in order to protect the pollinators, and this is what a good pollinator garden should have, it should have forage sites, in other words, places where you can get pollen. It should have nest sites. Um, it should have water. And it should reduce the use of pesticides. This is one thing, the, the reduced pesticide use, that is really important. If you could completely eliminate the use of pesticides in your garden, that would be ideal. Uh, sometimes you might have a problem with either aphids or some other insect that you really can't completely eliminate it. If you have to use it, use the lowest dose possible. Do not spray in the early morning because that's when the foragers are gonna be out there most often. Also, if you would not spray during times when there are blooms on the plant, that would be best. Um, and you should also encourage the, the use of native predators, like praying mantids. And that's where the series is building on, you know, I'm talking about, if you know the difference between a good bug and a bad bug, which is next month's talk, then you can squish that bad bug mm -hmm. and let the good one live. Yeah, um, I have two questions. One is, what, is, what impact, if any, does, does uh, sprays to, to, uh, to, to stop deer from nibbling from things have on pollinators? And the other question is, when you say provide water, how close do gardens work? Close? I was thinking, well, I've got a slide on the no, water thing, no. so I'll get that. But spraying of the most of the sprays that are repellent for deer are not toxic to bees. They are mainly things that smell bad. Okay. And so they have been formulated to be protective of the things that you, you are trying to protect too because it's kind of pointless to spray something that's going to kill bees on your flowers that you want the bees coming. Yeah, so I think they have been formulated to that. Yeah. I've been worried about 
um, so many of our neighbors have been uh, getting the service to spray for mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. That's harming the, the bees. That is, that more than likely is going to be doing damage. So if they could be spraying those, depends on the time of day when they are spraying them. If they're spraying them early in the morning, that's going to be the biggest problem. Uh, the bees come out and forage. They start early in the morning and then sometimes they'll go back to their nest sites and forage again later in the day. And when it's really, really hot in midday time, the, there are few bees out there. So, you know, if they could time it a little bit better, but otherwise I think that those are going to be problems. I've been using the garlic oil for the mosquitoes and it's worked well. Do you know of that? I don't think garlic oil would be any problem to um, the bees. Okay. I've, I've not heard anything, at least we as Master Gardeners have not been told anything about that. Because okay. that's um, worked great. I know there's an awful lot of discussion going on right now about neonicotinoids and yeah. their impact on bees. In fact, I had a discussion with somebody at one of the big box stores. I mean, they, the nursery was so proud of spraying their plants with neonex that they put an additional label in there that said your plant is protected by because we sprayed these on there. Yeah, Marilyn. Um, the vegetable gardens in Ohio, the operated by Ohio State University, was right next to the bee lab. And we were told that we could only spray after 7 o'clock in the evening. So I don't know if everybody heard that, but Marilyn said that the, um, the vegetable garden at Ohio State University was right next to the bee lab, and they could only spray after 7 o'clock at night. And this was a research garden. Yeah, so it was a research garden. And so I don't think we're going to get the mosquito sprayers to all work after seven o'clock at night, but you know, if we could let them know of our concerns and maybe they would do different kind of schedule. The neonicotinoids are systemic, so they are on the blossom constantly. Yes. So, so that's the real problem. So neonics can be put in the soil and they're systemic and they're taken up through the plant and that stays on the flower the whole time. There are some that can be sprayed on, and I don't know if you can wash them off or not, but then there, I read that there are some that are injected into the plant too. Hmm. So those also are a problem. But, um, and, I, and I was trying to look up the, the latest research. Unfortunately, the research has all been on honeybees and neonics and no research on the 400 to 500 um, native bees that are the ones that are most likely going to be pollinating your plants unless you're within two miles of a hive. So I just, I don't, I couldn't find anything on, because that research hasn't been done, because the honeybees are such a big industry and the solitary bees are not an industry, so the money goes to honeybee research. So reduce your pesticide use or take a bucket of soapy water out there and knock the bugs off into soapy water. I really enjoy squishing the hornworms on my tomato plants. Uh, you can spray bugs off. That works too. So nest sites of the 400, the native bees, 70% of them are ground nesters. So if you could leave a little bit of bare ground somewhere on your property, maybe put a little bit of ground cover over it just so that you know not to walk on that area, that would be a big help. This, this slide right here is each one of these is an individual hole for a bee, and I think they are solitary bees, because almost all are solitary bees, but they also make their colonies, um, they put their solitary nests in a colony. And this was alongside the road where my husband and I walk every morning, and it was a steep side so that there was no vegetation growing on there. And this 
I did read that these colonies can exist for 10 to 20 years in mm. the same place if they aren't disturbed. Well, now there's a new subdivision coming in, and this will cool those. And that's uh, the big reason why <coughs> pollinators are becoming more and more, in, not, they're not in danger, but in danger is because of the habitat <coughs> destruction. So if you can leave a little bit of bare ground. Also, uh, master gardeners get a lot of phone calls about mason bees and carpenter bees, and they're drilling into my deck or into my house, and it's going to destroy my house. Well, they really aren't going to destroy your house, but they are loud, and they sound terrible. So if you want to try and lure them somewhere else into your yard and get them <coughs> off of your deck, then um, drill some holes in wood or put up, actually the Arboretum now has out in the trial beds on a post, it looks like a little silhouette of a house with a piece of plywood, and it says buzz on the post. Yeah. And that's to attract the, the carpenter bees and mason bees to drill in that plywood. You could do the same thing in uh, your yard. You could also leave some logs or stumps out put them in a place that's out of the midday sun and maybe uh, where it could stay a little bit of moist. Also, some of these native bees that aren't ground nesters will nest in grasses. So they drill a little hole in the grass and they'll lay their egg in there and then they'll go to the next stem and drill a hole and lay another egg in there. So if you can wait till spring to cut down some of your grasses so that the hollow stems are there for an available that would be another way to provide nest site so water the question was how far away does the water need to be well most bees because they are flying all over and to and from their nest are going to travel a pretty good distance so in my house i have a little tiny water garden I do provide a little stick here so that birds and fro frogs don't need it. But if the bee has some place to land on, I also read if you could put some rocks uh, in there so that they can come and land on the rock and then get a sip of water. I also put out old frying pans, you know, when they're not sticking anymore. <laughs> Instead of throwing them away, put them out there. I put them on the ground. I've seen frogs. Birds taking a bath, birds getting a drink. I've seen bees getting a drink. Also, if you have a muddy area in your yard, put some sea salt in there and kind of think damp salt lick. That will attract butterflies and moths. I've been trying it so I could get a picture, but with all the rain that we had, I can't, a puddle just becomes a river. But I have seen it when I've been out hiking that there would be 30 to 40 butterflies all in a mud puddle. And what they're doing is they're getting the trace minerals from the mud. So if you add a little bit of sea salt, you're helping them with those trace minerals. They also like manure in that puddle. Manure in the puddle, OK. Yeah. So if you have access to manure, I know I have access to salt. Especially horse manure. I don't know why it is, but the puddle club, the males are uh -huh. all there. Tails. Yeah, and it's a, a sight to see. It is amazing. So pollen does equal food. And I'm trying to get people to think not pine pollen. Pine doesn't need pollinators. That stuff that covers your trees and yards and windows and is blown by the wind, it doesn't need additional help. But <laughs> the trees and the other trees and flowers and shrubs and, and we need to think year-round, not just summer. And try and think about different types of blooms. Sometimes simple are best. And a variety of colors. And a lot of people know about uh, plant-specific, insect plant-specific, uh, combinations. So, so the words, the monarch feeds on the milkweed, it lays its eggs on the milkweed. The caterpillar has to have milkweed to eat. And while that's not pollinator specific, there are certain insects that are pollinator specific. 
So I do want to talk about pollinator plants, um, and it's really important that you stagger your bloom times, especially in the early spring to help for reproductive success. Bees and the other insects need pollen year round. So if you can get something blooming in early spring, by example, letting some of your garden vegetables like spinach, lettuce, broccoli, bolt, then there's a flower there in the winter time that wouldn't necessarily be there if you didn't let them bolt. You can also think about trying to um, plant things, and I've got some slides later, that bloom in the early spring. The, another way to stagger bloom, bloom times is that the uh, fairgrounds garden, starting next month, we will go in and we will prune back by half the salvias like black and blue, salvia, asters, some of the mums that are would be blooming earlier. If you cut them back by half now, it forces them to bloom later. Because we're trying to get the fairgrounds garden to look really pretty at fair time. Well, that's usually October 15th to the 22nd. And that's pretty late for a lot of plants. <coughs> so that's another way that you can stagger your bloom times. And also, plant in groups. Not only does it make a better target for the pollinator, but it's like a wow factor for your garden also. And I'm going to emphasize perennials simply because they come back year after year and master gardeners try and make it easy for most gardeners. Annuals work, that, that's a fine thing to plant, but also think about trees and shrubs. And don't forget to include the night bloomers. My favorite night blooming uh, is moonflower. It attracts, there are moths that are out only at nighttime. Um, bats are out at nighttime, and they could be pollinators for this plant. So now I wanted to talk about pollination season by season. I'm going to concentrate mainly on flowers, but I also wanted to talk about trees, shrubs, ground book covers. So trees, think about it. Maples start blooming. February, March around here. That's the first ones you see. Then red buds. Then um, another good pollinator tree is the poplar tree. Uh, One of the best things <coughs> in the early spring is the tulip poplar. Tulip poplar, yeah. exactly. Yeah. My bees go to that. And in my yard, the best tree, I have three different kinds of um, flowering cherry, and they bloom about three to four weeks apart. So the first one, I think, is a kame that blooms late February, maybe early March. And when you walk under that tree, it sounds like fuss all going on overhead <laughs> because there's nothing, there's not a lot else blooming. So everything that is out and about on a cold winter day, and I think I forgot to mention, I forgot a lot of stuff. <laughs> Honeybees don't fly around till it's 55 degrees, and the same true for most bees. And the bumblebee will be out in colder and wetter than some of the other bees. But on a warm day, bees don't hibernate in the winter time. They go into a, a diapause state. So when it gets to be 70 some degrees in the winter time, if you have something blooming, it will attract whatever is out there flying around. Are our witch hazels attractive to yes, pollinators? Yes, they are. They are good pollinator trees. So when my next flowering cherry blooms a month later, you don't get that same sound above your head because there's other things that are blooming in the garden and they're making the rounds. Um, shrubs. There are winter jasmine. Edgeworthia, Spirea, Viburnums, especially those an awful lot of native Viburnum. Ground covers would be things like Ajuga comes out in the spring. Partridge berry is a really good native ground cover. And I'm talking a lot about sun gardens, but 
if you have a lot of shade, you can still have a pollinator garden. Hellebores and hostas provide blooms that are attractive to uh, hummingbirds and bees. So think about what you could do in your shade area also. And it doesn't have to mean dry, sunny areas. If you have ball gardens, you can plant stuff that will bloom in those kind of areas also. So I wanted to start with winter. <coughs> this is the fairgrounds garden in winter. This was a year when we didn't have a frost until late. So the mums were still blooming, the asters were still blooming. But uh, the standout at the fairgrounds garden is Edwardia. It blooms um, mid to late January. It's got super fragrant blooms. Bees were all over it on warm days. So that would be a good one. Also, fragrant honeysuckle. Um, in the winter, daffodils. There are some that bloom really early. Crocus. Um, hellebores. So if you've got shade, hellebores would be a good winter. Spring, spring's easy. The fairgrounds garden, we have creeping flocks blooming. The salvias are already starting to bloom. Sometimes the roses are blooming. We have uh, ground covers. We have mint. We have creeping oregano. It will be blooming to sevens. Not blooming yet, but and in the woods, wildflowers are blooming. It's just an awful lot of things. And Three of my favorite spring bloomers, and I did pictures of just tubular blooms because think about the shape of the flower that you've got in your yard and all these insects that I've been talking about that are pollinating <coughs> your garden are going to, a lot of them have different shaped mouth parts, so if you can include a variety of different shapes of blooms, then you will be helping the insects that have different mouth parts. But my favorites are uh, coral honeysuckle, cross vine, and of course the native columbine. So summer, a lot of the, you know, then we start thinking about annuals. Um, some of the black-eyed Susans are blooming then. A lot of different, I mean, summer's just easy. Salvia, agastache, coneflower. Um, I put this slide in here because of the ant, and he's more likely going to be food than a pollinator. <laughs> but a ball garden can also be a pollinator garden. So if you have a wet area and you want to put in a little ball garden, that could be a part of your pollinator garden. But Salvias, there are so many different kinds of salvias. Tall ones, short ones, every different color. So depending on your personal preferences, you know, you can put whatever you want in your garden and still have a really good pollinator garden. I included this slide of uh, pineapple sage because I had gone to a talk by a hummingbird expert and the hummingbird that we have here starting the first week in April until mid-October is a ruby-throated hummingbird. But there are a few others that have sometimes been found here in the wintertime, Rufus hummingbird. And she was saying that your best chance for attracting one of these other hummingbirds to your garden is to plant pineapple sage because it doesn't bloom until late September, early October and that's when those other hummingbirds are coming around. So if you want to try and attract an unusual hummingbird, then try a pineapple sage. And this was just an idea of a, a mixture of colors. Have pinks and purples and whites and oranges and different pollinators are attracted to different colors. And it just makes a prettier garden also. So, this is one of my favorites. Again, it's a tubular flower. Blooms starting right about now. And um, the blooms, you can get different varieties that will bloom 
throughout the year. And I know that in a lot of garden lectures and in garden magazines, they will give you lists of plants and it will be this hybrid and it will be Echinacea Kim's knee high or Echinacea tomato soup. And I'm trying deliberately not to mention specific hybrids or varieties for two reasons. A lot of people have problems with deer and if you search out these um, maybe rare and unusual hybrids, they're expensive and you put it in your garden and three days later it's been eaten. It's, and I think everybody's garden should be what they want it to be. If you want to look for the rare and unusual and expensive, then that's wonderful. And if you don't want to do that, and if you want to have your old-fashioned hollyhocks and columbines and natives that are not the new hot hybrids, well, then that's fine. If you're going to plant what you love, then you're going to be out there maintaining that garden more so than if you are planting something that you're afraid is going to be eaten by deer or squirrel or rabbits or in my yard also raccoons and possums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So fall. Fall is the time in the water wife garden when we're trying to have it look the best. The asters in bloom, chrysanthemums are in bloom, fall coreopsis is in bloom. <coughs> and it's just and I said before, if you can prune stuff back, then you can have a lot more um, blooms in the fall. Goldenrod is blooming at this time. The beautyberry is a good plant for the fall. Its berries are there. Of course, the pollinators would have been there earlier. And this is an example of a um, black-eyed Susan that is one of those unusual hybrids. It's called Henry Eilers. And it's got this neat uh, roll to the petals that makes it unusual. So we've been able to fence deer out of our garden, which makes it easier to now start planting some of these unusual things. But before that, I would just buy run of the mill. And a lot of times you can't find the unusual plants. You go to your local nursery. So buy what's at the local nursery, support your local nursery, and buy what you love. Finally, I'm getting to Waterwise Gardens. Mm -hmm. I thought I wasn't going to talk at all about Waterwise Gardens. But the reason I am concentrating on pollinators because, it, in my opinion, a Waterwise Garden is basically <coughs> the same thing as a pollinator garden. There are certain principles, and I hope everybody got the, the brochure about Waterwise principles. But we have this sign at the Waterwise Garden that says, Be Waterwise. And it, it's a, a matter of site design. So look at where your garden is. Don't put plants that need a lot of water in a hot, dry, sunny spot. Um, do have a good soil. And I brought, as a good master gardener, soil sample boxes and the sheets, so anybody who hasn't had their soil tested in a while, I can pick up some of those after the talk. Uh, right, paint, right plant, right place, exactly. I'm not going to talk about turf. Watering. We do absolutely no supplemental watering at the Waterwise Garden. That could be the, exactly the same way in your own garden. But mulch, mulch is the key. Mulch is exactly what makes the biggest difference between a pollinator garden and a water-wise garden. And I wanted to emphasize that water-wise gardens are not xeric gardens. They're also not rain gardens. A rain garden is where you have designed a garden to catch all the water that comes off of a certain area and then slowly release that water. A water-wise garden is um, simply one that is well mulched, right plant, right place, and has good soil. So at the fairgrounds garden, when we have mulched a, a garden, it just looks cleaner. The plants stand out more. We, I want to emphasize that you 
only need two to four inches of mulch. You can use any kind of mulch that you want. Leaves are fine, uh, shredded hardwood, shredded pine, pine bark, uh, gravel. I was even behind a lady at one of the big back box stores and she had 15 bags of shredded rubber. And it works. I mean, it, it, it is a mulch. But if you would put some organic material on your garden, that's going to break down, provide nutrients to your plant. Sure, you're going to have to replace the mulch sometime in the future. And this lady is probably never going to have to replace her shredded rubber. But <laughs> she's going to have to spend more money on uh, supplemental fur nutrients than she is. So. So two to four inches, make sure you don't mound it up around your trees, pull it back from trees and shrubs so that the voles won't get in there and, and have shelter and a hiding spot to get in and start eating your plants. So those are the, but mulch is the primary difference between, oops. So the brochure has six water-wise principles in it the first is planting and design. I think I talked about that. The second one is soil improvement. Uh, if you can add amendments to your soil, compost is really good. That would be a, a good thing. Have your soil tested before you start putting a lot of nutrients on there. Turf areas, I'm not going to talk about that, but basically if certain grasses need less water than other grasses and some are more adapted to sun and some adapted to shade and the same with efficient irrigation. You don't want to be, if you are, have to water your plants, do it in the most efficient way. Mulch is the most important thing and there are certain plants that are low water use plants and I think they give a list of those in there. So my last slide is why I would think, and, and it's like the Johnny Carson drum roll, ladies and gentlemen, and the number one reason why every pollinator garden should be a water-wide garden is to protect water quality for me, because that was my career for so many years. And water quantity is an aspect of water quality. I, before I quit, and we had a drought year. I was working in a watershed that was 40 square miles in size, and there was not a drop of water in it. And I went to towns where they were trucking in water. So water quantity is an aspect of water quality. The less water that we put or have to put on our gardens to uh, maintain them then less runoff is going to go into our rivers and streams and the more bugs I will have that are near and dear to me still living in our streams. So with that, we can open it up to discussion, questions, anything anybody wants to talk about? I know bugs are beneficial, but if you're trying to get rid of things like ticks, shavers, Can you repeat are, the question? Yeah, okay. I'll repeat the question. There are beneficial bugs, but there are also things like ticks and chiggers and all those things. And Kathy just went to the doctor today with she had a severe reaction to a tick. <laughs> so you do need to protect yourself. And I think that's a lot of why people are spraying now for mosquitoes. But we had found a product that I'm going to ask my husband, Terry. It was that thing that we put on the ground and you watered it in, and it was specific to, okay, he goes, oh, <laughs> no help. But there are products that you can put on the ground, but I would put them, because all these bees are ground nesters, what we did is we only put them on the paths where we're walking on a regular basis. So. The bees are not going to be nesting in your lawn or your turf because that grass is too tight. 
basically growing there and there's not enough bare ground for them to be nesting. So I think that that product, and I can't think of the name of it, would be okay to use on lawn and places where you're walking. And are um, yellow jackets considered beneficial? Because I don't find them very beneficial anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yellow jackets unfortunately are beneficial, but the yellow jackets normally come out, they're one of the colonial nesters, and they're gonna come out of one hole in the ground. And in my yard, what I did is put red flags around it so I would know not to weed near it or walk around it, and then I just avoided it. And the next year, they had moved to another place. So a lot of times, if you can avoid them for that year, but if you've got, you know, sometimes if you've got kids and stuff crawling all over your yard, if you do have, I mean, the, the yellow jackets are, they're, mm -hmm. they will attack. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. I was attacked by 30, 30 stings last year from yellow jackets. Oh, so no. I don't, I have a, try to be friendly in the yard, but yeah. when they attack me, I like to spray. Yeah. Which I'm sorry, I said that out loud. Well, you can, because they're colonial, you could, put something down in just that nest, cover it up, do it at night, because they're in there at night and they're not gonna be coming out. You could put something that will kill a bee there, cover it up, and then you will kill that nest and you wouldn't have to spray anything in your yard. Yeah. It occurs to me that we're gonna see a lot more people spraying because they're concerned about Zika uh -huh. in general, so I don't know. That was to treat for mosquitoes. That was the question that I, I didn't repeat her question, but that was the question. You know, there are a lot more you know, people are seeing a lot more of their neighbors spraying or having services spray for mosquitoes than they used to. My understanding is that they're using a pyrethrin product, which the duration is not long, but it's very potent. So if, if, did everybody hear yeah. that? Yeah. It was a here. I'm, why don't you repeat that? My understanding is that the uh, sprays that are used for mosquito control are primarily pyrethrins, which is not a long acting natural um, pesticide, but it's very lethal the time it is acting. Cornus moss to give me an early spring, and then I've used Glendera benzoin, and they both have yellow blossoms. But uh, yeah, another good shrub is um, sweet pepper bush. It's a native shrub that I've got in my yard, and it blooms and just tracks everything. I just love that. Yeah. Could you read your list of the 25? Yeah, top 25. So she's got them grouped by spring blooming, summer blooming, and fall blooming. And it's on her website. And it's on her website. As well as the list of everything she has for her. She's got the whole entire list of pollinator plants. And I've got it if you want to look at it that she's planted. But the top 25, I'll just do them real quick. Um, and would you all rather have common name, <laughs> Latin name? <laughs> and I kind of, I'm sorry, but I flip flop because my career was all Latin names and I try and do common names. Um, I'll do both. How about that? So spring blooming, wild indigo or baptisia, spiderwort, is tradescantia, purple coneflower, echinacea, purpurea, stokes aster, stokesia, levis, and she likes peachy's pick. <laughs> um, the blanket flower, galardia, bee balm, monarda, cat nymph is nepeta, beard tongue is penstemum, and golden alexander is zizia. 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 So summer blooming, all the milkweeds, and I was looking yesterday, 
I have four different milkweeds, Asclepias maillard, so that's kind of fun. Ornamental oregano, Oreganum lanthanum, passion flower, Passiflora, Anis hyssop, Agastache, Blue Fortune, Blazing Star, which is Liatris, Mountain Mint, which is Pycnanthemum, Lesser Calamint, which is Calamintha, Three More Summer, Stonecrop, Sedum, she likes Autumn Joy, mm -hmm. Sneezeweed, Alenium, Culver's Root, Veronat Castra, Verona Castra, Virginica. So fall blooming with spotted horse mint, Monarda punctata, any of the asters, Sympha, Sympha, Tricum, climbing aster, Ampelaster caroliniana. And I have to say that we visited her pollinator garden in December, and the climbing aster, she's got it climbing up, going up a brick wall. It was in full bloom, and it was just amazing to look at. It, it was amazing. Joe Pye weed, Eupatorium, Goldenrod, any of the Solidago species, and Ironweed, which is Vernonia, either letter Manii or Nova Barossensis. How's that for butchering Latin names? <laughs> <laughs> but her website is absolutely wonderful. What's the host plant for um, Lutamos? Luna moth? Anybody know the host plant for a Luna moth? I don't know. I will fire up the computer, but it'll take a moment. Yeah, it could get on the network as well. I have one in my camera. Yeah, I could show up every once in a blue moon, but I'd love to have more of them because they're so yeah. I don't know if there is a plant that's specific for them. I know there's a really cool a moth called the rosy maple moth that is attracted to maple trees. <laughs> um, any other questions while Chris is looking up to see if Luna is specific? Yeah. Um, how about um, good pollinator plants for a damp yard? I have lots of clients, some low spots that just really don't drain well. So, and they're not wet enough for ring. I mean, they don't get enough. They're just, they just hold a lot of it. So I would think that any kind of a ball garden plant, and I forgot to do my master gardener duty and, and be like Mike Gray and say we have online, if you Google um, either urban horticulture, there's brochures called landscaping to protect water quality, water wise use in landscaping, and there's um, drought tolerant plants. But there's also on the website, that, and if you Google urban horticulture, they have lists of water loving plants, not water garden plants, that was last month's talk, but those that like damp areas. I have swamp milkweed, which yeah, likes uh, wet. Cardinal flower. Cardinal flower, absolutely. Oh, really Cardinal flower. Help me out. Well, I finished my talk and my brain's gone dead. <laughs> I have a lot of luck with irises where it's wet. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, I'm thinking about, you know, or perennials. I mean, I have irises in the, in the, in the rain garden. I've got a lot of those. I guess I could just use it. So, cardinal flower, um, the lobelia. I mean, yes, that is the lobelia. The, yeah. So, there's always this pollinators deer don't like. Don't yeah. mind having their feet What's wet. Left? Yeah, the right. intersection of the four plants that meet that tree. Yeah. Okay. I found the Luna moth. Chris, find it. Uh, we're getting there. I found it um, on Wikipedia. They mentioned birch, alder, persimmon, sweet gum, hickory, walnut, sumac, sweet and moonflower as host plants. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason to have a sweet gum. No, there isn't. They're beautiful in the fall, but the rest of the year. Uh, <laughs> there are fall free. Yeah, you, you can have, yeah, they do, they make ones that don't drop gumballs, that don't have fruit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Well, a lot of alternatives. Yes. And including your moonflower that you like. Yeah, I do. I like moonflower. That's uh, Ipomia alba, so much for my life. Yeah. And another good vine that's, um, it can get weedy is Ipomia conquit, which is called cypress vine. It has the little teeny red flowers that just, 
The bees and the hummingbirds absolutely love it. But then it recedes and you pull up 500 of the cypress vine the next year. Oh, here we go. Birch. Oh, good. Yeah. That's what I wrote out. It's the same source. Yeah. yeah. The persimmon is native. Sweet gum, all those. All except for the moonflower. They're all native. So you could have a pollinator. Oh, good. I'll put some in and I want to make sure that people understand, you can have a really good pollinator garden if you've got shade and trees and shrubs. Right, right, right. You don't have to have perennials and flowers because these others will have uh, Denny Warner's favorite shrub for pollinators was Cirilla. Kind of oh, yeah. like a firework pattern flower on it, very attractive. And when we visited his garden, one of the volunteer um, parties when he was director, it was loaded in, in insects. What is the plant? Cirilla. Very pretty flower. Cirilla. Middle of summer. And uh, Itea is another shrub mm -hmm. that has some really pretty flowers. Oh, and they like the feeder. Yeah. Or dry. Or hot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, just, yeah. they're, they're just lovely plants. There are a lot of plants that, you know, are indiscriminate. They don't care if it's wet or dry. You know, you look and they'll say uh, wet tolerant, dry tolerant, drought tolerant. And you say, How could it be both? But there are plants that can take any kind of wet and then they'll go completely dry and they're happy with that too. Which is what the rain garden plants are. That they have to be able to withstand both the water both when it rains and they have to be able to withstand the drought when it's not raining. So, yeah. All right, well, if we have no more questions, I guess we'll get out of here early. Thank you so much, Trish. Yeah.